Here on Redoubt Productions, we've been on a bit of a railroad kick this month. We visited the Allegheny Portage Railroad, the first successful route over the Allegheny Mountains. Then there was our trip to the world famous Horseshoe Curve, which has allowed mainline traffic to navigate the Allegheny Mountains since 1854. But of all of these achievements, the coolest railroad relic in central PA might just be what we're talking about today. A whole railroad lost in time in the mountains of Huntington County. Sit back as we'll be retracing the historic East Broadtop Railroad. Taking a look at this map, elegantly drawn by a world famous artist, you'll see the full 33 miles of track that make up this line. All this came into existence because of the iron making industry in the vicinity of the twin boroughs of Orbisonia and Rock Hill, sometimes called Rock Hill Furnace, for the Juniata Iron Furnace that was opened in town in 1876. To make the process more efficient, it was decided in advance the furnace would be fueled by coke, which is made from burning coal at high temperatures. Large deposits of coal were located about 20 miles west around the community of Robertsdale. The railroad was created to haul this coal in the early 1870s, requiring two tunnels to be bored through the ridges of Sideline and Rays Hill. Because of the tight corners needed to be maneuvered around to get to these mines, it was decided the East Broadtop would be narrow gauge. The track is only three feet wide rather than the standard four foot. Not only did this allow the trains to move around sharp curves, but the rail is cheaper to produce. Trains would begin traversing the full main line around 1874. Today, excursion trains only move along four miles of track from the Twin Burrows to Colgate Grove. There's a Y on both ends of the excursion route, allowing the trains to be able to turn around completely without the need of a turntable. Although, there is a turntable in the middle of the shop complex, but more on that later. The railroad operated for about 80 years, outlasting the iron making industry that built it. The furnace went cold in the first few years of the 20th century, but the coal being mined out of the Robertsdale mines kept the trains rolling. At its peak, you could expect about six coal trains a day passing through the twin boroughs. Coal was offloaded in Mount Unit, where it would go through a state-of-the-art coal cleaning plant, then loaded onto Pensy Hoppers and off to the steel mills in Pittsburgh and beyond. But like most railroads, the Great Depression dealt the first of several blows of revenue. World War II gave the railroad an extended life as the demand in coal would spike in wartime, but by the 1950s, hoppers full of unsold coal began choking the yard at Mount Union. Passenger service was discontinued when the railroad lost its U.S. mail contract to trucks in 1953. The railroad's final operations occurred in April of 1956, with everything being shuttered up and awaiting scrap. Of course, riding the rails today, you know that that never happened. Ironically, it was the Kowalczyk Salvage Company that saved the line from the fate so many old lines met. For four years, the company's president, Nick Kowalczyk, hesitated to scrap the line. The reason being, he simply could not bear to put any of the locomotives or the historic structures to the scrapping torch. But being this was a time before preservation groups were much of a thing in the railroad community, all Kowalczyk could do was keep putting off the scrapping date. I mean, it was his company, so who was going to tell him what to do with 33 miles of abandoned rail? We're very thankful Nick held out those four years because in 1960, the Twin Burrows asked him if it would be possible to display one of the steam locomotives housed in the roundhouse for the bicentennial. He didn't display it. He restored a short segment of the main line and put number 12 into service to run excursions for the events. It was such a hit with the locals that it was decided that the excursions would run regularly every summer. For 50 years, multiple generations of Kowalczyks oversaw the tourist operation. As all the other short lines in the area became scrapped, the East Broadtop survived into the 21st century. The only surviving example of a narrow gauge railroad east of the Mississippi. But with a new century also came maintenance costs that seemed to only rise exponentially. One by one, the steam locomotive inspections expired with it too costly to conduct the required teardown and rebuilding to keep them legally running. The Kowalczyks began seeking a new buyer but could not find one. After the annual Christmas runs in December 2011, the railroad shuttered up yet again. It wasn't abandoned, but it couldn't run until a new buyer came up and took the responsibilities of remaining this historic line. 
It sat for nearly a full decade when finally a group of rail enthusiasts with the lofty funds needed to bring the East Broad Top back to life formed the non-for-profit EBT Foundation and purchased the line in February of 2020. Overnight, it seemed the East Broad Top became the number one subject amongst rail enthusiasts again. Tons of plans were discussed, and it seems the dream goal of the EBT Foundation is not to just bring excursion service back, but to restore as much of the main line as possible. Remember, Kovalchuk never scrapped any of the main line, he just sat on it. So all 33 miles of the old main line remain intact, albeit now heavily overgrown and in dire need of some TLC. But that's a long, long ways off. Let's talk about what's going on right now in Rock Hill Furnace. Well, shortly after the announcement of the EBT Foundation, the world kind of plunged into pure chaos with the thing I can't talk about or else YouTube will ban me somehow, some reason why. I don't know, but you know my luck. But while this inevitably put a damper on EBT plans for 2020, it may have been a blessing in disguise. No year of major public events meant track work could occur unobstructed. Since 1983, preservation work for the railroad has been conducted by the all-volunteer group, the Friends of the East Broadtop. They're initially focused on small restoration projects during the Kowalczyk Age, but now they've essentially become the main track crew of the railroad. In just a year and a half, they've managed to rehabilitate all of the old excursion length of track. You go there right now, the track looks brand spanking new. It's incredible the work that's already been achieved on the line in the past year. Begin in spring of 2021, regular excursions returned, and in early October, excursions now reach all the way to Colgate Grove. Now, for the 2021 season, all trains have been pulled by number seven, a diesel electric 50 tonner. Well, one of its previous owners beefed it up to be technically a 55 tonner. It was used by a steel mill up in Ontario when the East Broadtop acquired her in 1993. And right now, she is an unsung hero of the railroad. Without her, none of these excursions would be happening as all the steam motive power is over in the roundhouse out of service. For now. Again, we'll get to that later. When the excursion age began back in the 60s, a small fleet of boxcars and flat cars were converted for excursion use. I chose to ride smack dab in the middle. They also have two original cabooses you can purchase tickets for, and on a cold day like this one, the potbelly stoves were on full blast. Because all four excursions this Saturday were sold out, they added on the president's car, uh, named Orbisonia. For a first time rider like myself, there was plenty to gawk at as the train moves at a leisure pace. It crosses Backlog Creek and rounds around Orbisonia before leaving the small business district behind and out into some of the finest countryside in the Keystone State. cuts through several small farm lanes. The further you go from Twin Burrows, the older the sparse farm sets seem to become. You pass under a bridge holding up a private lane, and we'll move past a small campground along Agua Creek. High Phil traverses open fields, passing by the old Runk Road Bridge. From the hillside with the barn, a rail fan will get the best shots they can before the train disappears into a patch of forest. Emerging out of a cut and into Colgate Road. The tail end of the Y sits on a spur to a clay pit. Quarries were another major industry along the East Broadtop for brick making back in Mount Union. The Y was established in 1961. Passengers were left off at the Picnic Grove and could take a later train back to town. You can bet that these pavilions are on the hit list for the EBT friends. We're not quite finished on our return to Rock Hill Furnace. The train makes its biggest road crossing, that of Meadow Street in the middle of town. It's 
it's on this leg of the Rock Hill Y that we pull into the Rock Hill Trolley Museum. It's a separate entity from the East Broad Top, but both organizations co-promote several events throughout the year together. They have the distinction of being the first trolley museum in Pennsylvania. They go back to 1960 and have a colorful collection of streetcars from around the country, and even a few from South America. They are open air cars and are great in the summer, but on a rainy day in October, not the best ride. Let's go on something more climate controlled. The crowd for the 10 o'clock train were all put on one of the museum's largest cars. This light rail vehicle that operated in San Diego. Well, it's not what you would expect at a trolley museum in the middle of Pennsylvania, is it? A relatively recent light rail car from California. It was actually built in Germany back in 1981. I believe it's the newest car on the line, complete with automated PA system, so while you look out the windows into the Pennsylvania woods, you hear the names of streets in downtown San Diego. Yeah, it's an interesting experience to say the least. Though we're now on a trolley, we are in fact still riding on an East Broadtop right-of-way. This mile and a half of track along Backlog Creek sits on part of the Shade Gap Branch, which was used to access various ore mines. Speaking of ore, one ride in the trolley will spot the ruins of the old Juniata Furnace, the same furnace that necessitated all these trains in the first place. Trolley's dead ends at Route 522. The museum have set up a nifty little platform here that can keep two cars in holding. On this particular day, we were offloaded instead at the Midway siding so families could go out and grab a pumpkin from their makeshift pumpkin patch. They also had a variety of crafting tools back at the station to carve and decorate their jack-o'-lanterns with. I took this time to get a few quick shots of the car. The volume of riders fluctuates the number of cars being used on any given day at the trolley museum. This particular day, they were also operating three additional older cars, all of these from Pennsylvania. This is car 311. She goes back to 1922 and ran on the Johnstown Traction Company lines. What makes her so special is she was the very first car acquired by the railroad, acquired in 1960, fresh off its final day of regular operations in the Flood City. So in a sense, this 100-year-old car has never really had a period of abandonment. Another Johnstown car resides on these rails, number 355. And as a nerd for all things Johnstown, I couldn't resist the chance to take a second trip down Backlog Creek on a Johnstown trolley. Three five five is what one thinks of when you hear the word trolley. The old wooden interior, the creaking seats. The old advertisements. Especially got to love the Lone Ranger one. All of this handsome interior and exterior was a result of an extensive restoration project. When Johnstown streetcar ceased, number 355 got picked up by a proposed museum up in New Hampshire where it sat for years and rotted. Those museum plans never came to pass. But 355 is running now alongside 311. And this similarly painted car, number 163, a rare curved-sided car from the York Railways. Built in 1924, it operated until its home line abandoned in 1939. Someone purchased it, took off its wheels, and planned to use the body as part of a summer home up in New York. That was all great until 1972 when the floodwaters of Hurricane Agnes pried it from its foundations and flooded the whole car. The owner donated to Rock Hill, leading to the museum's most challenging restoration job. Over a span of 17 years, a worldwide search was conducted to gather all the parts needed to put 163 back into operation. In a sense, dozens of streetcars now live on in the now fully operational 163, which funny enough has operated longer at the Rock Hill Trolley Museum than it did in York.
Now, as much as I'd love to hang around these trolleys, especially the Johnstown ones, we got a tour to get to. This is a new feature of the East Broadtop. They've begun offering guided tours of their shop complex. This is what makes these broadtops stand out amongst all other railroads. Not only is it the only narrow gauge line east of the Mississippi, but all of the shops and most of the rolling stock is original to the line. A lot of these buildings were established back in the 1880s to do the necessary repairs to the cars and locomotives. You can imagine all the wear and tear that would happen as trains wind around sharp curves with 10 or 15 hoppers of heavy coal. And, well, management decided that the whole railroad needed an upgrade to fit the 20th century to be able to bring coal down from Robertsdale more efficiently. They ordered in 10 steel coal hoppers from the Press Steel Car Company based out of Pittsburgh and, well, the East Broadtop liked them so much that they set up the necessary facilities to start producing their own hoppers right here in Rock Hill. Over 200 steel hoppers were manufactured in these shops throughout the railroad's history. At its peak, it produced 30 hoppers in one year. The fleet is largely intact. You'll see parts of it spotted throughout the yard. This is the only fleet of steel hopper cars for any narrow gauge in the country. Of course, upgrading the rolling stock was not all that was done. Management upgraded their fleet of steam locomotives to be bigger and more powerful. The six that currently reside in the roundhouse are all Mikados built by the Baldwin Locomotive Works. What's unique about all of them is that unlike most steam locomotives, they have an additional truck of wheels expressly to support the firebox. This allows for these fireboxes to be built as big as they can for a narrow gauge locomotive. The bigger the firebox, the larger the fire, the more water you boil into steam, the more steam you produce, and you guess it, more pulling power. As far as I'm aware, these are the only examples of this type of Mikado anywhere in the country. First was number 12, built in 1911, which was later dubbed Millie after Nick Kowalczyk's daughter. This is number 15. She came onto the line in 1914 and was the last steam locomotive to operate here back in 2011. The remaining three locomotives got a redesign, making them even bigger and more powerful than anything else on the railroad. Number 18 here was the last one built back in 1920, the largest of the six, and boy, you can tell. Not only just standing next to her, but also resting next to number 15. Number 18 hasn't moved under its own power since the end of the freight age. Her sister, number 16, however, has the honor of being the first one of her fleet to be restored to operations. We didn't get a chance to see her, but she was in the roundhouse in the recently renovated stall number 8, which will now allow the team here to do a large portion of the restoration process of all the engines on site. Oddly enough, number 16 also hasn't run since 1956. You'd think this would have led to a lot of problems, but surprisingly, she was in the best shape to be restored. She was in the process of a major overhaul when the railroad closed, so all the friends need to do is finish what the railroad started back in the 50s. There is another reason she never ran, and, well, it's because the older crews claim she was haunted. The valve system up in the steam dome here is, for whatever reason, slightly different to the rest of the fleet. It would re frequently leak even after hours of operation, and, well, if she wasn't shocked up, the manager down the street would be startled awake when number 16 rolled into the wall of the roundhouse. So, yeah, nobody back in the day wanted to get in this supposedly haunted locomotive. But she'll be back on the rails soon, hopefully as early as next spring. We'll just have to wait to see. Now we're entering the complex's machine shop. All of these were operated by steam power, powered by two Babcock and Wilcox boilers feeding steam into a stationary engine that drove the belt and shaft system that runs along the roof throughout the entire complex. Keep in mind, this isn't the, the countrywide Pennsylvania Railroad whose shops are in nearby Altoona. This is a short line in the backwoods of Pennsylvania. This isn't something one would expect to find on any other short line. It's because of all of the surviving machinery that the railroad is on the National Register of Historic Places. Select machines are in operating condition, and I'm sure one day just about everything will be back in operation as the need of, to repair the locomotives and rolling stock comes back. One of the major projects the friends have been up to is saving these buildings as over the years they've kind of sunk into the ground. Donations allowed for this shop to be stabilized this year, and you can see this gap showing how close we were to all of us collapsing and being lost forever. 
In the back of the machine shop sits number 14, which is nearly identical to 15 back in the roundhouse. If all goes well, number 14 will be the second steam locomotive returning to service. Currently, she's torn down, several of her wheels have been removed, and the boiler jacket was also just recently removed, which was asbestos lined and required an extensive operation to remove it all. Number 14 last operated back in 2005, so hopefully its recent operation history will mean a smooth rebuilding effort. Next to her is coach number 8, one of the only surviving wooden coaches from the EBT. This has been an ongoing restoration for many years as it's required a brand new beam fabricated and extensive interior and exterior restoration. Well, it looked like all the pieces were coming together until that new beam cracked under pressure. So it's back to finding the right wood necessary to construct another beam, such as the way of the arduous journey of preservation. There is so much here that just one trip will not cover it all. I got up here around 9.30 in the morning and was wandering around and taking photos all the way till the sun started setting. I didn't even have time to take the trip to explore Robertsdale where the friends got a museum set up in the old depot. There's also a neighboring museum dedicated to the region's coal mines. I've heard good things about it, but all in due time. I hope to be back out here sometime in the spring of 2022, maybe make a weekend of it. We could go to the Robertsdale Museum, or we can go up to Mount Union even, and hopefully by then, fingers crossed, steam will have returned to this historic line. I thank all of you who have stayed for all of these videos and those who have also followed my other outings to other bits of railroad history. I am a railroad nerd, if you can't tell. The coming videos will be steering back into other avenues of history. I'm hoping to start digging up some obscure stories from my neck of the woods, the Royal Highlands. But before we say goodbye to the Allegheny Railroads, be sure to hit that like button to let YouTube know history videos matter. And if you would wish to listen to me ramble more about things like these broad top, consider subscribing to support Readout Productions. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.